Hello, I'm Joan from the Southwest Spokane County Historical Society, director of the Cheney Historical Museum. Today I'm going to tell you a story about the rocky beginnings to Cheney becoming a college town. Our story is going to begin back in 1881 when Cheney was just barely two years old, but was already the Spokane County seat those pioneer days, there were two types of schools in the West. Subscription schools that charged a fee per student. The money was used to pay for the teacher and expenses. And there were also territorial or district schools which used tax money to pay for teachers and expenses. It was in 1881 that a group of men met in the Northwest Tribune newspaper office on E Street, now College Avenue, to discuss how they would build and fund a school for the town. The group included Daniel Percival as chairman, that's this fellow here, and Lucien L. Kellogg, who was the Tribune editor, and he was secretary of the group. Now, Alex Abernathy, the land agent for the Northern Pacific Railroad was also there, and he was acquainted with Benjamin P. Cheney, the direct, a director of the Northern Pacific Railroad, who was known to be a supporter of educational institutions back east. Mr. Abernathy suggested that the men write to Mr. Cheney because he may provide some financial aid for the project. So they wrote him a letter. Now, sometime later, General John W. Sprague, who was the district superintendent for the railroad, brought them the reply from Mr. Cheney that flattered by his namesake town was going to send $10,000 books and instructors out to start their school and would also get approval from the railroad directors to donate eight acres of land on the hill above the town. Cheney Ben hired a Portland contractor who bought lumber and erected a two-story building 66 feet by 36 feet with the long side of the building facing toward downtown. It was located where 6th Street used to cross the campus. The Cheney Academy building interior had plaster walls with a four-foot high wainscoting. Construction began in the fall of 1881, and the Benjamin P. Cheney Academy opened for its first 12-week term on April 3, 1882. A hallway rang the length of the building, dividing each floor into two classrooms. Now, there's actually some disagreement about this in the stories that are told about it, and some people say that it had a cross hallway so that there were four classrooms per floor. I decided to compromise in my little drawing there. The school taught the common school grades with the primary grades one through three and the intermediate grades four through six. It was a private or tuition school. In 1883, the Cheney School District entered into agreement to have the academy as its school, funding through taxes for students within the Cheney School District and tuition for students outside of Cheney, as well as using donations for funds. In 1886, the academy expanded to teach the advanced grades of 7th and 8th. But also in 1886, dissatisfaction and complaints were mounting from the parents that the academy was dominated by Congregationalists, and those parents feared that their children were going to be indoctrinated into that faith. So in 1886, the district got approval from the territorial legislature to borrow up to $6,000 to build or remodel their own schoolhouse. In November that same year, Cheney lost the second county seat vote, and by January of 1887, there's a vacant courthouse building in Cheney available. Having an alternative, the Cheney School District withdrew from its agreement with the Academy. They hired newly arrived William J. Sutton here as the principal and opened the Cheney Public School in the remodeled courthouse building. The Academy returned to funding itself by tuition fees. Now, Mr. Sutton is remembered as a charismatic man and a powerful and persuasive speaker. He was a beloved teacher who inspired his students. 
By 1888, the following year, the academy began losing students to the Cheney School. In 1889, Mr. Sutton even offered after-hours high school coursework on a tuition basis. High school students were not yet authorized by the legislature. Four students we know of completed his course, and one of them passed the entrance exam for the University of California on the first try with very high marks. This cost the academy even more students. January of 1890, the Academy started its last term, and it closed its doors on April 1st that year. Doors may close, but Washington's 1889 statehood brought a new opportunity for the Academy. The 1889 U.S. Enabling Act meant that the government donated lands to the states. Section 16 of each township range was for schools. 100,000 acres in Washington state was specifically designated to fund normal schools. Also in 1889, voters ratified the state constitution, which included language stating that providing a public education was the paramount duty of the state. Our friend here with the mutton chops is Stephen G. Grubb and he was a state representative. Now later he wrote his recollections of the history of the school and of course he was the hero of his own story. So he wrote that he negotiated with the Academy trustees for the transfer of the building and property to the state for a normal school. He also said he introduced the bill to the legislature. I'm guessing that state Representatives Alex Walt and B.C. Van Houten, also from this area, helped him out. The bill for the Cheney stated that the Academy would donate the land for the establishment of a training school for teachers in perpetuity. The challenge for Representative Krubb was that Ellensburg was already a clear favorite and considered a central location. I mean, that's where the Constitutional Convention had been held. Did the state really need more than one normal school? Did anyone really live out beyond the sagebrush and the Columbia River? Grubb, Watt, and Van Houten did a lot of whining and dining, lobbying, filibustering, and political maneuvering to hold up other legislature dear to the West Side politicians until they got a vote on Cheney's normal school. And on March 22, 1890, Cheney was established as the first state normal school in Washington. Now, within a week, both Ellensburg and Bellingham were also approved, but we were first. So what is a normal school? A common school education was considered critical to maintaining our democracy. The graduates of normal schools were critical for reaching into all of the canyons and forests and hills and lonely homesteads, offering children the opportunity of an education. The goal was that no child would have to walk more than five miles to reach a school. The, these students were taught the art of teaching on those various subjects and that it was using a modern scientific standard for the teaching of subjects as well as these teachers understanding childhood development and the science of managing schools. The normal school opened for its first term October 13, 1890. Here we see the class of spring of 1891. This was the last class to attend the school in the old academy building. In the spring of 1891, work commenced on a two-story addition to the back of the building, which would be 24 by 60 feet at the middle of the rear of the building, so making the ground plan a T. This addition would be used for an assembly room, gymnasium, library, and a laboratory, and it had the same central hallway design as the original building. The rooms were furnished in the summer and equipped, and we were just one week away before the start of the fall term, when on the night of August 27th, 1891, a fire erupted in the basement of the addition, burning the entire school building to the ground. An investigation concluded that the fire had started 
when an overheated mortar bed had caused some rags nearby to ignite. The next day, rooms were secured in the Pomeroy Building on First Street, which was used for the 1891-1892 school years. That same year, in 1892, William Sutton was promoted from vice principal to principal of the Normal School. He'd come over when the Normal School opened in 1890. This building does still exist down on First Street. It's lost its little crown and its awning, but over here is where you'll find recreations, and on this side is the Red Zone Tavern, which many of you will remember also as Goofy's Tavern. Meanwhile, lobbying the legislature for funds to rebuild began. And in March of 1893, the legislature passed a funding bill. And there was a great celebration at the Hughes Hotel in downtown Cheney with people coming from Ritzville and Sprague. The men were celebrated and were given these gold-headed canes for their efforts. But a week later, the governor vetoed the bill. Crestfallen, those plucky citizens of Cheney came together with a plan. Now they had passed a bond to build themselves a new school building in April of 1893, but now they came together and they agreed that they would allow the normal school to use that building until a new normal building was completed. In the early days, the old courthouse sat over here on the corner and was still being used by the public school classes for a period of time. Meanwhile, lobbying began again, and in 1895, appropriations was passed, and this time the governor signed it. In a grand ceremony with special trains bringing dignitaries in from out of town, the cornerstone of the new building was laid on October 15, 1895. Here we see the new normal school under construction. Now the granite, along the foundation and the entryway was quarried out of Medical Lake. And while it's difficult to see, here's the cornerstone laid into the building. Commencement ceremonies for the graduates of 1896 took place in the new building, even while it was still being worked on. However, a storm of controversy enveloped the school and the town over the construction finances. There were accusations and demands for investigations and resignations bantered back and forth through the town's newspapers. The older paper, the Cheney Sentinel, took up the side of those demanding resignations for the mishandling of funds. The Cheney Free Press was actually established in April of 1896 to counterbalance that reporting. In the midst of all of this, the normal school opened for its first term of classes in October of 1896. And though Mr. Sutton was never accused of any wrongdoing in the affair, he was angered by the events and abruptly resigned from the normal school on March 1st of 1897, with several other instructors leaving in as well at the time. Now, partly in response to all of this controversy, the governor vetoed the annual funding for the school in June of 1897, and it closed its doors. However, those plucky citizens once again set about creating plans and deals, and by July of 1898, they had reopened the normal school without state funding and held the fall term as well. And in February of 1899, funding was approved and the town, with the help of the state's new newspapers, shamed the governor into signing that bill. The main floor, first floor of the building, contained the library as well as the principal's office and a number of classrooms. And here on either side of the main corridor was the men's toilets and the women's toilets. The auditorium filled the rear wing of the building on the first floor. It was 68 feet in diameter with a stage here and dressing rooms on the side. Harry Lindahl, a student at the Normal School, recalled a story involving Mr. Opplinger, who's pictured here. He said, 
I attended the normal school in 1911 and 12. They had showers and toilets connected to a cesspool outside. Now before we had outdoor toilets. I remember that crud used to get thick on the top and plug up the toilets once in a while, and they would call on Mr. Opplinger to come down and fix it up. And he'd take off the cover of the cesspool and reach down in there with a stick and push the crud and stuff back away from the opening, and everything would drain and be okay. Now, on one occasion, he was reaching down there and working on it, and his watch fell out of his hip pocket, and it lay down there on top of the crud. So he reached for it, and just as he got a hold of it, he slipped and went in. Now, there was a ladder built into the side of the cesspool, so he got a hold of the ladder. He came out all covered. He was all covered with that crud and stuff, and he quickly put the cover back on and went home. He'd only been married about two weeks, and we often thought, we wondered what his wife thought of her new smelly husband. Here's a view into that first floor library that was on the west side of the building catching the afternoon light. The lower floor of the building or basement was reached by the central staircase or by staircases at either end of the front wing of the building. That contained a number of recitation rooms or classrooms while on the other side, we had the superintendent of the training school's office as well as a laboratory and utility rooms. I kind of wonder what level of noise the superintendent had to put up with with that boiler and the blowers just across the hallway. The rear of the building contained the circular gymnasium and behind it a 8 by 24 foot bath or pool along with storage for uniforms and equipment as well as a dressing room. Here we see the female students in their athletic uniforms in an exercise class in the gym. Now coming out from behind the label, we see the heating pipe and vent. Now we have a pair of these pins in the museum. Now I always thought there was part of a set of juggling pins, but then I saw this photograph and we have a pair of the exercise pins from that normal school. And here we have a peek into the chemical laboratory, probably the one in the basement of the school. Now we run up the stairs up to the second floor. In the central tower was the boardroom for the trustees of the school, looking out over Normal Avenue toward downtown Cheney. The second floor, like the first floor, has men's and women's toilets on either side of the central staircase, and the remainder of the rooms are classrooms. In the rear is the gallery or balcony of the auditorium. And here we're looking out from the stage of the auditorium toward the seats with the balcony up above and out toward the front door of the normal school building. Up that central staircase one more time and we reach the third floor, which held the music room at one side and a room for various clubs and societies to meet on the other end of the building. The tower room was designated in the drawings as a museum, but we know that it was used as accommodations for a couple of, of the unmarried male teachers. Over the life of the building, additional will windows were added to this floor of the building. The normal school offered grades one through six to students through their training school. Instructors demonstrated teaching techniques and the student teachers got to observe in a live classroom situation. Initially, the training school department was housed within the school building, but in 1908, a three-story dedicated training school building was opened just west of the normal. The normal teachers demonstrated teaching and discipline techniques in these classes, as well as observing the student teachers being able to teach within a live class situation. 
Here you see the rear view of the normal school building taken somewhat after 1908. The heating plant building is over here on this side. The normal school gym and auditorium here with a playground in the background and the new training school right here on the right side of the building. And now let me introduce you to the subnormals. While the Cheney Public School expanded to teach grades one through eight and later added high school courses to the regular curriculum in 1899, many rural schools still taught just the common grades one through six. Students who wished to continue needed somewhere to go. The normal school took up the gap. They offered courses for the upper grades, the seventh through ninth, calling it the subnormal. Students could then go on to the normal school or end their education with their advanced certificate. In a second disaster for the school, late in the evening of April 24, 1912, fire believed to have started in the chemical lab in the basement, tore up through the brick-clad but wooden interior building. People yelled and yelled for the two teachers who were living in the third floor room, Mr. Miranda and Mr. Wirt, to get out, to get out of the building. But fire was already coming up that central staircase and they were trapped. The firemen then ran and grabbed a carpet from a nearby home and yelled for the men to jump, to jump for it. Mr. Wirt did jump and was safely caught. However, the billowing smokes obscured the firemen's view, and they were unprepared when Mr. Miranda also jumped. He was badly injured in the fall, but made a slow but complete recovery. Harry Lindahl recalled that one morning when I came to school, I found it in ruins, burned to the ground. When I came to school that morning and saw the smoke rising up and the small flickers of flame with the firemen still playing their hoses on it, I thought, well, no school today. But I was to be disappointed because President N.D. Showalter had organized. They had organized classes in homes, classes in churches, and in the Cheney School. So school went on as normal that day. The administration and some of the classes moved into the training school, as well as using rooms in the congregational church. The training school classes moved into a space that they then shared with the Cheney Public School, just as they had back in 1893. As Harry Lindahl recalled, all of the records were burned up in the fire. But they had a wonderful person in teacher Salon Kingston who remembered the names of the graduates and all of their grades. I know from personal experience that he had all of my grades exactly right. And I had the honor of graduating from the Methodist Church and no other class at the normal school can say that. This time, the legislature and the governor did not balk at providing the funds for rebuilding the Cheney Normal School. Here we see a design for the new school. The salvaged brick and granite stones from the old Normal School were sold for many purposes around town. And some of that granite was purchased by the Students and Alumni Association to create the Herculean pillars at the entrance to the school. On June 27, 1914, some 2,000 dignitaries, teachers, students, and spectators gathered for the elaborate ceremony led by State Senator William J. Sutton, Grand Master of the Washington State Masonic Lodges, to lay the cornerstone for the new normal school building. And salvaged from the ruins of the old building, they also set the 1896 cornerstone on the opposite side of the entry. Here we're looking east along 6th Street. The brick for the new building came from a factory at Micah, Washington, and the terracotta used in the decoration of the building came from Renton, Washington. As a side note, some of that granite from the 1896 school was purchased by the General George Wright Women's Relief Corps, an auxiliary organization to the Grand Army of the Republic. 
and it was placed in City Park in 1916 as the base for a future monument in memory of the men of the Civil War. When the GRR post closed in 1924, the women of the Relief Corps completed their monument project as promised, again using granite quarried from Medical Lake to match the base. The women dedicated and had carved on the stone memorial to the Civil War, the Spanish War, and World War I. In this image, we see William J. Sutton here posing with the construction crew as the building nears completion. The entrance to the building consists of 10 large pillars which hold up the massive balustrade, entirely made of terracotta and finished with decorations. The formal dedication of the building took place on Saturday, May 22, 1915, with special trains coming out from Spokane and Governor Lister in attendance. The first floor of the building on the left wing held the domestic sciences department with a kitchen and dining room as well as a faculty dining room, along with sewing and fitting rooms, plus the women's cloakroom and toilets. The right wing held the music room along with several piano rooms, a lecture hall, ag laboratory, biology laboratory, and a testing lab along with the boys' restrooms. As you enter the rear wing of the building, you have the girls' dressing and locker rooms on either side of the hallway, and then the gym takes up a large area of the wing. Its interior was finished with white pressed brick with a maple floor. There were two sets of concrete bleachers near the entrance. At the rear of the gym, there was an 18 by 40 foot plunge pool, and the boys' dressing rooms were behind that. Here we see the women's dance class in the gymnasium with bleachers and the basketball hoops in the background. And here we see a woman about to dive into the plunge pool in her fabulous 1920s swimming costume. Throughout the building, the wainscoting is of a beautiful Alaskan marble, specially chosen and matched. The floors are also of marble or a light terrazzo with mosaic borders. The interior woodwork is of a solid oak in a light fume, and the walls are tinted to give an old ivory effect. In the classrooms, the floors are made of a veneered hardwood. And of course, there are marble staircases leading up to each floor. The second floor of the building holds administration offices with the principal or president's office overlooking Normal Avenue. The remainder of the second floor holds the history and mathematics classrooms on the left and the educational department classrooms on the right. There is a large reception hall in the center of the building. Before entering the auditorium at the rear of the building, we have the women's faculty's retiring room at left and the men's at right. The auditorium has a slanting floor and originally had wooden seats. With its gallery above, it had an original capacity of 747. The semicircular stage projects out over the orchestra pit and behind the stage there are dressing rooms and storage. The design of the auditorium is of a Greek classical motifs with ionic pilasters and Corinthian capitals, fretwork, swags, and garlands that have been recently restored. The panels of elaborately molded plaster are still painted with the original gold leaf color. Students in this classroom are typing away in their business class from the 1930s. Up on the third floor, the gallery or balcony over the auditorium is in the rear wing, as well as the large library in the central area of the building with skylights adding natural light to the 1915-era ceiling lights. The library served students until Hargreaves Hall opened in 1940. The left wing of the building holds the physical laboratory, oral expression, German and Latin classrooms, and at the front of the building there is a chemical laboratory as well as the primary grades children's library. On the right side we have more classrooms and at the end there are the drawing and vocal music classrooms. In this view of the library, you can see the skylights, and maybe you can just make out those tiny electric lights in the ceiling. 
Here we see one of the third floor laboratories, which isn't that different from its predecessor in the old normal building. And finally, in another ceremony on June 14, 1940, the building was renamed Showalter Hall in honor of normal school president Noah D. Showalter, who had led the school during the years of disruption following the 1912 fire. If you've enjoyed this quick look at the origins of our university, please give us a thumbs up if you did, share this video with friends, and check out our website for the EWU Story Map Tour, as well as our blog, which has many more articles about Cheney history and buildings. And if you have any questions or corrections, leave a comment or send us an email. Thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye.